Welcome to episode five, which is um, the Black Friday special. So um, uh, hopefully we've got uh, some bargain basement treats for you. Uh, we've got some bits and pieces to cover, so uh, we'll cover the news in a second. Um, uh, I get a turn with a talking stick and I'll be going through the um, how you can use the Slides API with um, Google Apps Script. Spencer is going to um, talk us through uh, some ways that you can customize the script editor IDE to, to make it a bit more uh, beneficial, easier to use. And um, Bruce has got some stuff on polling. So um, I think the, the we'll, we'll cover the, the slides API, which is one of the kind of the main pieces of news uh, that's come out since the last show. Um, but um, also Bruce and I were uh, fortunate to be invited across the Mountain View uh, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, we got some time with the um, Google uh, App Script team and also uh, some of the other Google developers uh, with various APIs there. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot of the stuff that we got shown <laughs> is um, not for public information yet, but um, I think, and I think Bruce would agree that um, it, it seems that um, Google are, are committed to um, App Script. So that's quite often one of the questions I get asked when I'm um, doing presentations on Google App Script is, you know, is it going to be around uh, in the future? And um, certainly from the investment that they've put in um, with various features and products coming out, hopefully not too, uh, uh, hopefully quite soon. It looks good. Would, would you agree with that, Bruce? Yeah, I, def I definitely think so. We met some of the team that work on the various products, and uh, you know they were very enthusiastic about what they were doing. They showed us lots of good things that were coming up, and we really came away feeling fairly um, confident that this is a platform that they're going to develop and stick with. Yeah, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to cover some of those new uh, developments in uh, future shows. So uh, uh, it was always you, you never quite know with um, release time timelines with with Google. So hopefully we'll see something this year. But if not, um, hopefully it'll be stuff early next year. Um, so moving on to so, uh, one of the uh, other uh, releases uh, um, that have come out recently, as I mentioned, was the, the Slides API. So um, there, this isn't incorporated in Google Apps Script as a, um, a service or an advanced service. So it, it's actually quite easy to use uh, if you've used the Sheets API. So this is uh, the, the the external API for Sheets. You'll probably recognize the, the workflows for it. So what I thought I would do is just give you um, a quick kind of demonstration of um, what you can do with the, the slides API and, and how to set it up. So I'm just going to share my screen. So you bear with me for a second. So there's um, a couple of use cases um, Google mentioned within their um, uh, product launch. So things like um, using t templating um, t or just uh, you know, up, updating key bits of text and information uh, in a slide deck, um, you know, quickly and programmatically. So here I've got a, 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 a demonstration deck, and um, it's got two placeholders um, set up already. So we've got a, a name placeholder here, and um, we just got a shape uh, placeholder up uh, in. The, the top corner here. So what we're going to do is just run a script that is going to uh, make a copy of this um, presentation, and then uh, it's going to uh, we're going to just update the name here, and uh, we're going to uh, throw in a, a logo uh, in in this uh, uh, placeholder here. So um, I've prepared a script. Um, you can. Also view this on uh, my blog, and I'll share the scripts. Uh, I'll I'll share a link to that later. So um, a lot of this is actually made a lot easier thanks to Spencer and uh, the magic 
of his um, uh, Google uh, uh, directory API, um, which basically um, generates libraries for for all the the Google APIs. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things to to set up. So um, because this isn't a built-in service, we're we're calling uh, uh, one of the libraries Spencer has created. So this is for the, the slides API. So usual sort of thing. We um, adding uh, the library. We can enter the code in there. I've already done that. Uh, for this example, I've actually renamed the, the identifier. So this is uh, an identifier that's used um, quite often in um, uh, Python versions of uh, the uh, Google client libraries. Uh, the reason I've done that is this is uh, actually an example that um, I've ported from Wesley Chun, who uh, works for Google, and uh, there's a blog post explaining that. So the last thing we need to do in terms of setup having installed the library is um, just uh, enable the library API uh, through the developer console. So again, if you haven't done this before, it's relatively straightforward, just a, a case of clicking on a couple of links. Um, so we're into a Google developer console, and so we can just uh, select the, the APIs we want to enable for our app script project. So I'm going to select the slides API, and um, I think I think Google have kind of hidden this button up here. I think it's it's e easy to miss if you're uh, um, not used to this sort of thing. Uh, so we can now see that this is enabled. So I can just shut those down, and uh, I'm just going to quickly talk through some of the script. So um, we're just setting up. Uh, a couple of variables here. So these are basically going to be some of the, the search strings that uh, we're going to use just to search for uh, the, the image and the uh, demonstration template I showed. Obviously, there's lots of other ways of you gathering um, you know, uh, file IDs and passing file, file IDs in your scripts. Um, this is the, the way Wesley done it, uh, had done it, so I, I thought I'd just um, uh, copy what he'd, he the way he set up his code, just so people could see the the differences between Python and um, Google Apps Script. So the, here's the first call. So this is because um, uh, we're using uh, a, a, a library to, to access the the slides API. We're going to pass in our token. So um, one of the nice things that um, I think it was Spencer spotted. Uh, or possibly remain was if you're using Drive App or uh, sheet, Spreadsheets AP or sorry Spreadsheets app within your project, then you can just use the tokens uh, that those generate and pass those into the um, uh, into the slides library. Um, so it's you know if you're using those, it's really easy to set up. So we're just passing those in um, with a function. So next couple of lines are kind of uh, Fairly, fairly standard stuff. So uh, we're just going to search for that um, uh, slides uh, API template demo, uh, and we're just going to make a copy of it and just grab the ID of that new copy. Um, the next thing we're going to do is um, actually what I might just do is if I just fire up the debugger, um, what you can actually see is um, how uh, the, the the slide object is returned uh, from the API. This is actually quite a useful way if you're wanting, uh, you'll, you'll see further in the code um, in terms of how we're passing updates to, to the slide deck. It, it's actually useful to, to, to see how um, the slide is, you know, represented in uh, an object format. So you, um, you can see the different page elements. Uh, so for example, let me just see if I can find one that I recognize. So for example, we've got a, a rectangle here and we've got the shape properties. So there's various, you know, information about, you know, the color and position. Um, so just going back to the code for a second. So all this 
part of the code is doing is actually looking for uh, our, our rectangle. So all it's doing is looking for this shape object here. Uh, and we're just holding that in the variable, variable object. And uh, the next bit, so now that we, we know where we've got uh, our object, um, the next part is uh, we're going to get the, the image that we're going to use to, to replace the, uh, the, the, the rectangle. So we've got, we're just again uh, getting a file by a name uh, from, from Drive App. Um, one of the, the interesting things with the slides API, um, when you're um, incorporating images into uh, changes to slides, is it needs a, a public URL for that image. Um, so there are a couple of ways around this. I, I was a bit surprised that there wasn't native uh, Google Drive integration into this, so that you could just provide, um, you know, uh, uh, a file ID. Uh, instead of an image URL, but there are a couple of ways that you can get around this. So um, uh, I don't think these are um, documented, so they may disappear, but uh, one nice way is if you just get the download URL for, for the image and you can actually append uh, an access token, which is our, um, our, uh, our, our script project um, of token the end of that URL, and that basically gives a, t a temporary um, URL that um, the Slides API can then use to pull the image into the, the slide. There's a, another way that you can do this, um, which is similar sort of idea. idea. Um, this one is using uh, a, another uh, undocumented URL. Uh, in this case, the, the image would need to be shared um, for this to work. So. Uh, you might want to stick to the, the download URL method um, uh, just to, to save having to uh, share images. In terms of what making changes to, to our copied um, slide deck, basically we, we pass those in as a, a, a JSON object. So um, it's very much kind of uh, similar to the Sheets um, API in terms of making changes um, to text and cells uh, and properties. Um, so, for example, you, you've got various verbs that you can use. So, um, this one we're uh, replacing all text. So, here it's just using a search string. So, it's looking for our uh, our mustached uh, name, and it, we're we're just getting a, a replacing that text. And for the image, uh, we've got uh, the um, uh, passing in the image URL. And this is where um, we're pulling back some of the uh, existing slide information. So we're actually pulling the, the size from the rectangle uh, to, to basically resize our image uh, to fit. Uh, and again, any sort of transformation. So if that rectangle was rotated, uh, then we're just using the existing information and passing it um, back in when we're creating our image. And uh, last one is just deleting our rectangle. Um, so that JSON object um, covers everything that we want to do with, with our slide. And so the last step um, is actually to pass those commands in. So uh, if you look at the, in fact, let me just show you, if you look at um, the autocomplete on slides, there's you know there we've we've not got many methods here, um, so everything is really handled by you know passing in commands by uh, the JSON object. Um, so we're doing a batch update. Um, so the deck ID is just the, the the presentation ID, and then all our requests. So. If the demo gods are with me and I hit run, it's all fired off okay. And so if I go into my drive folder, you can see it's now got hello world and uh, it's replaced the image. Easy peasy. Very good. 
So once you got your Google now going, you can do that by. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 Bruce, as you've um, used the the Sheets API, is do you do you recognize some of the ways that you know this you know the the structuring the code and the API calls? Yeah, they've pretty much standardized that. And one of the the key benefits, I think, is this idea of batching. Um, because what it means is that you can do a whole string of things and it does it in the order that you need it to do it in. So rather than um, calling the API, you know, 50 times um, yeah. and then dealing with mistakes and dealing with quotas and everything else, you're making one call with 50 things in the call, um, which is a, a much, much better way of doing it. And that's the uh, the uh, batch updates for that's the latest version of the Sheets API you're referring to? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what's what's up next then, then Martin? Are we going to do uh, the, I think we're going to do the, the, the Chrome add-on from yeah. Spencer. Thank you. Do you want to go, Spencer? Yeah. All right. So um, last month, we talked about um, an extension that was put out by a, a guy named Leon Hart um, for uh, GitHub. It adds GitHub uh, capability to the IDE. So what I did is I looked, he, uh, he released his extension open source um, on GitHub. So I took a look at the code and I realized that it's actually not that difficult to uh, be able to add um, additional functionality to the IDE. So I, I uh, took his code and I modified it and I added the ability um, to add um, a toggle to this side. Let me, uh, let me add my, share my screen real quick. So, um, so right now with, with my extension, you usually have this big, huge bar on the side and it takes up most of your, your space. So you, your code is getting pushed off to the side and it has a big list of files that you only need to look at once in a while. So I was, you know, I always deal with like dragging it over and dragging it back. And so what I did is I added a sm made a small little extension. It adds this button in the top left and you can click on it and it makes your, and it makes the sidebar just hide. And if you ever need it, you just drag your mouse to the left and it pops out. And so it just adds a nice little auto hide feature to this and uh, gives you more space to work on. And especially, you know, if, you know, there's already a, a compact view. So you can actually start getting a nice big full uh, work environment without so much clutter around the top and the bottom and sides um, by using this extension. Um, if you can find it, it's in the, uh, the Chrome web store. You can install it directly from there. It, it installs there. And then again, it, I, if you look on my GitHub, it's on my, the source is on my GitHub. And if you want to look at the original, which uh, this is based upon, you can always look at uh, Leon's GitHub for uh, Gas GitHub, and you can you can dig through that code if you're inclined to look on this, and you can see that uh, it's really not that it doesn't take too much to be able to add additional functionality um, to the IDE to 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 modify it to your needs. But this only works on Chrome, right? This is this is a Chrome extension yeah. only. Yeah. Which is which is uh, I don't know. I'm I'm guessing that most people that use AppScript use Chrome anyway. But um, you know, I think yeah, I think so. one of the issues is if you if you start to rely too many too many times on cut off some people who are not necessarily doing that. So, Spencer, there was an announcement not too long ago about the Chrome Web Store changing, disappearing. Or something. Hey. Yeah, so that is not going to be for extensions. Okay. Um, extensions are still, are, Chrome extensions are still going to be supported. Um, what they're talking about is Chrome apps. Chrome apps is a, was a different beast altogether than extensions and themes. Um, Add ons uh, fall under the extensions kind of uh, realm. So Chrome apps is, uh, they were standalone programs that were packaged and distributed through the Chrome store. Some of them are, you know, were written in, you know, native C++, you know, and compiled to an app. Um, those are going to be disappearing in a few years. 
Uh, I know they're going to stick around on Chromebooks for a while, then they're going to be phased out there. But they've made no mention about removing extensions, which I would say 98% of everything on the Chrome Web Store is an extension. Okay, I think that's great. I mean, it's a, it, you know, if you can if you can get more screen space out of the ID, I think that's a, a really good thing. And there was another guy who who uh, a Chrome extension a little while ago about being able to change the the skin of your ID as well, which uh, some people like. Correct. And that so I think that you know, I think the idea of having a kind of a um, a place that we can put together a list of things that help to make the IDE better in an organized way, I think it would be a good a good thing to do. Well, that, that's actually something that I've been looking and tinkering with is if, you, you know, too many extensions get into the IDE, you're going to start getting a messy IDE. So I was thinking of maybe uh, possibly kind of getting together and, and kind of developing kind of like a unified way of almost like a plug-in structure for the IDE to where... Yeah, I think that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, the, so I've been actually playing around with with a plugin, uh, you know, basically making a plugin extension, and then having the these apps as kind of add-ons that you add to the the plugin, and uh, I, I've got some interesting interesting results on that already. So that might be something I can release. Maybe maybe I'll even get to for the next next one. Yeah, I think that would be wonderful for the next uh, some release. Yeah. Thanks, Spencer. That's good. Yeah. So we, we watch with interest. Um, so, we, yeah, we'll put links up as well for people to find that extension, uh, dig into the code. Next, we've got Bruce, and um, you're going to do some uh, stuff on showing how we can uh, poll for changes within, um, I think, primarily add-ons. Yeah, so not necessarily add-ons, but that's uh, the main usage. So, so what this is about is that when you think about the the Microsoft environment, they have an ad. They call them add-ins. It's a bit like Google add-ons. Um, they appear in a sidebar or a dialog box, just like with Google Sheets uh, and Google Docs. And the idea is that you're able to extend Office by creating these apps that sit on the side of the of Excel or whatever. Um, just exactly the same thing, but there's a massive difference, and that is that the um, Microsoft um, environment, you're actually addressing the object model of the spreadsheet to which you're attached directly. So in other words, what that means is that if someone makes a change in the UI or changes the data in the spreadsheet or something like this, you can immediately see it reflected in the add-on because you're using the same object model. Um, on the other hand, you're, you're, there's only certain amounts of things you can actually do with that. So in other words, you can only do what the API can do. You can't make things up and that runs on the server and call them. You can't do that. Um, but the, one of the great benefits is that if there's a change in the, the data or the position of, that someone is in, in, in a document or something like that, you can do what's called binding, which means that you can ask it to call you back if that happens. So in other words, your add-on can sit there doing nothing um, and get woken up by the fact that someone's changed some data. Um, in Sheets, you can't do that because there isn't, a, there isn't anything persistent going on in the server that could call you back, even if there was a mechanism to do it. So that means that, that when you're doing an add-on, it means your client has to be in control because the server isn't there unless you call it. So... To be able to emulate that sort of behavior that you can do in Microsoft, in other words, react to changes in the document whenever they happen, you have to write something in the client that continually pulls the server on. Now, that can get quite complicated, um, but actually, it's if you use a kind of a boilerplate approach, then you don't have to write it every time. So when I write an add-on today, I have a boilerplate of code that I pull in and it takes not very long to write an app um, that uses this technique. So let's take a look at this one. Can you, uh, I don't know if I'm sharing my screen. I'm probably not, hang on a second. Um, there we go. Uh, what should I be sharing? I should be sharing my Chrome. No, what should I be sharing? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Am I sharing the right thing here? Yeah, I can. 
see your, your browser. Okay, great. So for the purposes of uh, going into how this works, I've got this spreadsheet here that's running a little sidebar. And uh, it doesn't do much. All it does is to take whatever data is showing on the screen and show um, on the bottom a chart based on it and in the top some data about where it is on the sheet. So this is telling us what, what active range is E7, which is where that is. Um, the, the ID of the sheet, the sheet, the sheet name that we're at, so we're at this water area place, and then a few other things. So the idea here is that every time that I do something on the sheet, it will immediately be reflected over on the sidebar. So if I go to you know population or something, you can see that the chart updated, and so did all the stuff about the about where we are on the sheet, etc. If I maybe change some data, let's just change that to something else. Then you can see the chart immediately changes. I we'll put it back, and the chart immediately changes again. So all that's going on. Uh, that's actually not easy to do unless you're polling from the stuff that's running on the client, which is the sidebar, back to the server to say what's happening now, what's happening, what, what's happening now. Now, when you think about it, that could be an awful waste of time if nothing's happening. So what you try and do is to minimize the amount of traffic from the server, which is in Google somewhere, to the client, which is in your machine, so that you don't have loads of data continuously flowing back and forwards. So you have to have a mechanism to say, if nothing happened, then don't send much. So we're going to look at all those things um, right now. We'll, we'll, we'll take a, a quick look at the code. So let me bring that up a little bit. And I'll use uh, Spencer's little thing to get rid of that. So what we're going to look at, now let me bring it back a minute, because what we're first of all going to look at is the there's a lot of stuff here. And the reason is because, as I say, this is boilerplate stuff that I bring into um, add-on projects. Um, so we're only, only going to be interested in one or two things here. So let's start by looking at the, the main app, which would be uh, here. No, in fact, let's, look at, let's start by looking at the markup, in fact. Let's get right back to the beginning. So this is my app. It's not much there. And uh, just as a bit of background, if I write stuff that's got to run on the client, JavaScript, normally people would use HTML files for that, but I don't. I use GS files. So I, I use regular um, app script files, but run them on the client. And the reason I do that is because I can write code that can run on both the client and the server without having to duplicate it. So I've got these little functions that take care of all that business, but we're not going to go into that. So these are the these are the, the 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 files that I bring in for this app, and the ones that we're going to look at are process, uh, render, and client watcher. So client watcher is the one that runs on the client and pulls back to the server from time to time. Render is the one that shows it on the screen, and process is the one that controls everything that's going on. So we can let's look now at the main app. So it only does a couple of things. It takes in all the Google stuff to do with drawing charts. It starts the app up, which is just about um, creating a space to report on errors. And then it starts the um, process off, which is essentially setting up all the data structures I'm going to need. And then it gets to this watch or start. And, and that, so that simply means get the thing that watches the server going on the client. And that's all there is to the app. So very straightforward so far. Um, let's look at the initialize part. So we're going to go here. And here's initialize. So to, to, to use the watcher, you first of all have to tell it what you want it to watch. OK? So I'm creating a new client watcher. And I'm saying that if anything happens to the sheet, in other words, which sheet he's on at any time, then do something. And the something that I want it to do is to update the navigation box. So if you go back to the spreadsheet for a moment, um, on sheet, if I change sheet, then it's saying 
update that stuff over here, okay, which is what it just did. And I'm saying on values, which means if any of the values change, then redraw the chart. So if I go back here and I change a value, and let's make that zero or something, you can see that the chart changes. So in each of those cases, that on statement that we just looked at was being executed. And then I've got on active, which simply updates that navigation part again. And what that means is that if the area that's the active selection, in other words, if I select something like, um, like that, then you can see that the active selection over here changes to what I've selected. So you can see it all works fairly uh, seamlessly. You can't, you wouldn't notice that there was anything peculiar going on here. You think it would, it was really somehow detecting in real time what was happening on the sheet, although that's not actually what's happening. So that's all there is to it in terms of initializing things. You tell it what you want to watch and what to do when it happens. So now let's take a look at the client watcher now, which is the guy that does all the, all the hard work. And we'll take a look at how that works. So first of all, we've got some settings. And the first one is the poll frequency, which says, how often do you want this to happen? I like to take up a, a prime number for that, but it's not, necessary, not really necessary. Um, and that's really saying that every just over a second, go and have another look. And then we've got the thing, the data to take back. You can take back any data you like. I happen to be taking back both background colors and values here. So all those things that you've got in spreadsheet app, spreadsheet app, get values, spreadsheet app, get background colors and so on. You can put any of those in here. And that's what it's going to be sending back to you. And then this is uh, the things it's able to do. So right now it can do, by the way, this isn't the one I use in my real add-ons because I measure a lot of different things in here. I've cut it down for the purposes of this, of this demo because it would be here a lot longer if I didn't do that. So that this is the uh, things of, I'm allowing it to watch at the moment. And then finally, the scope is where to get the data from. So I can get it from the active selection. I can get the, from the data range, which is the, the whole sheet, or I can get it from a specifically selected range, which would have been specified in here if I'd said it. So all that describes uh, how often to get it, what to get, and where to get it from. So once you've got that set up, you're good to go. So let's go back to the, so if you recall in back in the main app, we just simply started it. So another thing I'm, I'm using in here is promises. If you're not familiar with those, it's a way of um, handling lots of orchestration of asynchronous events. So you'll know that when you use google.script.run and stuff like that, it happens asynchronously. And normally you have to provide a callback for what to do if it fails and what to do if it succeeds. And that, that's fine if you've only got like one or two, but if you've got many, which I often have, and, and I do have in this case, I've got many asynchronous things happen, or any of which might happen at any time it's much easier to use a prominence mechanism to um, orchestrate them. And you'll see a little bit of that as we go through the, the rest of the code. So it starts by starting the polling mechanism. So we'll take a look at that. Now that calls this thing called poll wrapper, which we'll quickly look at. And all that that does is it returns a promise again because it's asynchronous. And it's the first thing it does is to test if the, if the spreadsheet is actually on the screen, because if it's not, if someone's on a different tab or, or, or the browser and not looking at it, there's no point in checking the data right now because they're not going to look at it anyway. So, so that checks to see if that's happening. And if it is, then it kicks off um, a request to the server to go and get the current status of everything. And this provoke dot run is just a, a promise version of google.script.run. The code's all here if you want to look at it. I'm not going to go into, into all at the moment, but, but you can. So this is saying run serverwatcher.pull and give it all these arguments. Okay? And if the guy is not looking at the screen right now, then there's nothing to do, but we do want to signal 
to whoever's calling this that we're all, we're all done. So I'm sending back a resolved promise. So let's get back to the where we're calling that. So when all that's finished, it's going to do something. And the thing for it to do is if it got any data back from the server, then we need to check and see if anything has changed. Now, I mentioned earlier that what we don't want to do is to send data back if it hasn't changed, because then you're going to get loads of data coming back unnecessarily every second. So it uses a system of checksums. A checksum is a kind of a, a digest. You, you know when you download stuff from BitTorrent or, or in fact GitHub, there's a small code and that code describes the um, contents of the file. And if the file changes, that code will change. It's just a small um, 30 characters or something like that. So instead of sending back the entire data from the spreadsheet, all I do is send back 30 characters for everything that I want to check. And if the client, when the client requests some data, and that was back up here, one of the things it tells it is the data it already knows about using these checksums. So that means that if the server receives the same checksum as the current data now represents, it knows it doesn't have to send anything because the client already knows it. So what's happening here is that we're saying the data that we're going to currently store, because this current data is always going to contain the current status of the, of the spreadsheet, either because it got some new stuff or because it already knew it. And then this checksum, if it, the data is different than what it used to be, then we'll know that something has changed. So now we're going to go through, if you remember at the beginning in that initialize st status, we said what to do if the sheet changes or something like that. So it's going to call for every one of those that something has changed, it's going to call the, um, the function that's set up for that to happen with. So all that things together means that data doesn't get sent back if it hasn't changed. And your client function doesn't get called if nothing's changed. So there's actually very little disturbance, um, both in the your internet connection, which you could get filled up with all with the big spreadsheet, um, or in your client being distracted and doing things it doesn't need to do. And really, that's probably only one more thing to look at, which is the thing that gets called by the client. So that's on the server side, we have this uh, server watcher dot pop dot poll. So we'll take a look at that. And it's here. So now this is running on the server. And it's been told to go off and do some things, which was all the arguments that we passed to it about the checksums and everything. So it does the usual spreadsheet type things like getting the, you know, the data range and the active range and everything else. And then it checks to see what needs to be returned. So if you're interested in sheet, it's going to tell you everything about the current sheet. If you're interested in the active range, it'll tell you about all of that. And if you're interested in the values, it'll get whatever values you've asked for, whether it's background colors or values or whatever. And then later on, it says, okay, so now I'm going to do this digest thing, which is to convert the data into a into a, a, a checksum and I'm going to return the checksum that I now have. So what that means is that the, the um, by checking to see the checksum that is just made versus the checksum that the client already knows about, it knows whether or not to send any data. So that's kind of a brief overview of, of, of how it works. I think it's, a, it's fairly effective in the sense that, as I say, when you see it in real life happening, you wouldn't believe that all that stuff's going on behind the scenes. It's just really um, fairly, fairly seamless. So that's one way of doing it. There, is a, there are other ways of doing it, um, each of which have got different um, drawbacks. So the, the latest version of the Drive API is actually based on the real-time API. Um, so that's uh, the API version 3. You're used to using version 2 up till now. Um, and it has some new features, including changes and watching. So that means that you can watch out for changes that happen in your drive. So in this exact same um, app, I do have, I've made a web app as well. So now I can, let me just 
on that. So what this is doing is it's watching for changes happening on my drive. So it's from a particular point in time. So if I, if I was to go back to my spreadsheet here and maybe change something, let's just change that. You can see things happening over here. Jump back again. Um, and then go back to my web app. You'll see that uh, a couple of things have happened. You'll see that a couple of files have been changed since the last time that I looked. So what we're doing here is that not only are we looking for things changing um, on the spreadsheet, which is fine for an add-on, we can actually also look for things changing from an external application. So this makes, uh, there's another couple of things that have changed in the meantime. So that makes quite a useful sort of uh, app. We can clear it and what will happen now is it will start measuring again from from this point in time. And I've found some interesting things, I just wrote it this morning, um, interesting things in my drive happening that I have no idea what files they even are, or who could be changing them. So that's quite a useful sort of a diagnostic in any case. But um, the being able to do things on the spreadsheet, you can't do all of that through the drive API. You can't, for example, know that someone selected a different um, area um, you can, and you can't know that someone's changed the sheet. You can only know if they make actual changes to the, to the drive. So this is probably the, still the best way of dealing with uh, monitoring changes on your spreadsheet by doing this, this polling stuff. So that's kind of all I have. I know it was a lot of information in, in, in quite a short time, but I have published um, this, which gives you a little bit more stuff on it. And I have also um, put the source for this on GitHub and everything else if you want to take a look at that too. So that's kind of all. Any questions? Yeah, that's that's pretty darn cool. Um, I, I I do have a couple of questions just about um, one of the things I've been thinking about is is testing um, between versions of things that I'm working on. You know, so like comparing comparing what sheets are doing so this notion of the way you're using checksums is there is is there any way to to uh to do that if you just want to compare sheets you know like i don't suppose there's a way to do a diff between sheets or tabs out there well the way, I, the way i do that is with it simply with this digest which is a uh, actually uh we can probably look up what that is it's using simple um uh, app script utilities. Let's just quickly find that. Okay, so um, find that again. Here it is. So that that's the code for it. There looks like a bit of a handful, but it's actually pretty straightforward. So what that's doing is to take. Um, a whole bunch of stuff that gets passed to it. In this case, it's going to be the array values, um, the data values, I should say. And it's doing a digest algorithm on them, a SHA-1, which converts it into a 30 character type of a code. And uh, so what comes back is a string. And that string is, is a rather short one. And if anything has changed in the data, whether it be its dimensions or its, uh, the position of data or the contents of the data, then it'll have a different code than it had before. So you can just compare before and after and you've done it. Oh, cool. Okay, and that's in the example code? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. But that that will just let you see that there is a, you know, there is some difference between two uh, sheets. Um, yes, something changed, right? Yeah, so, but yeah. there are, you know, if you want to see what has changed, um, there, there are, I think, existing kind of um, diff JavaScript libraries that you could probably easily port into um, uh, app script that would, you know, let you know what has has changed, if that's important to you. Actually, there's a diff library on my website as well, if you want to find it. Oh, there you go. That's probably where I read it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. But, uh, but you know, I think, I think the point here is, though, that you want to be able to, in the shortest possible um, amount of data, 
know what something used to be versus what it is right now. And if it's changed, then you need to do something in addition to what then, then ignoring it. So that's kind of like, like the purpose of it. Right. Well, thank you. And so obviously you in sheets, there, there is an on edit um, installable trigger, which obviously it doesn't let you know if um, people, you know, selected regions of the, of the page. Yeah. Uh, it will only let you know if something has changed. Are you hooking into the on edit when no, you're? No, 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 not at all. I mean, the, the the problem with that is that if you're on the client side, then you know the server needs to call the client, and the client's already running, and that makes it that's complicated. So um, it's much better for the client to be in control um, because the server isn't persistent. So it, ideally, if the server knew everything about what it, it's a completely dumb thing. It's got no connection to the UI, apart from the on edit thing perhaps. But even if it was able to do that, then you would still have a problem with it. When you think of it because, um, well, okay. So you noticed that something had changed. What would you then do? Yeah. So in the end, so if you're running this in add ons, which obviously is client yeah. run, you're, you're not, you're, you're better going with your route. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah, because uh, I mean, obviously, if you're running pure server side, then you don't need to do any of this. But this is all about the the disconnect, if you like, between an add-on and uh, uh, the server side UI, which, as I said at the beginning, doesn't doesn't exist in in Microsoft, but does exist in in Sheets. It's pretty powerful stuff. Particularly the way that you've you've packaged it all, so it's I can see how you can start knocking out lots of um, add-ons quite quickly. Yeah, it it, it really is. Uh, I mean, actually, when you think about it, the two things that take ages in add-ons is all the um, you know the the UI part of it and writing all the HTML and CSS and everything for that, and that's a different story. Um, but there's also the communicating with the server and everything, which usually generally. Takes ages and you get problems and hard to debug and everything. If you've got a, a, a standard framework that does that, you don't need to bother about that anymore. You know. What about in terms of quotas? Obviously, there's quotas for the, the amount of server time. Are you are you hitting into those issues with this no, technique? Not, no, because um, you know when you think about it, the the amount of time that it's actually using it's first of all you've got to be using the add-on anyway secondly you've got to be looking at it which is what that invisible thing says so it's only going to be doing it for as long as you're sitting in front of the spreadsheet actually doing something and you're and also you're making changes so if in theory though if someone if you had a really kind of uh, kind of must use add-on that someone was sitting in front of all day using. Well, that'd probably be making a hundred thousand dollars a year off it. <laughs> figure out something to do. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, like I, for example, use a similar technique in, in a in an add-on that I use that that, that uses polling, and I find. Uh, you know, even with about 4,000 daily users, I'm only using 20% of my free quota for the API, you know, so, yeah. you know, so you, I don't even come close to, to even using the free quota. And once the free quota is done, then that means I'm popular enough to, should be able to leverage it for, uh, to, as a paid service. And then you sense. just get, move into a paid service and you get extra, you get extra API calls through the uh, developer's console. So there's, it's it's a very generous system that they get. You have to be really popular before uh, before you start hitting those kind of quotas. Yeah. From a from a memory and resource usage perspective, what what is um, when you start your workflow and you open up the sidebar, what still is being used when you close your sidebar? Uh, and what on your client question you makes sense yeah like um all the stuff you're you're running is stops running when you close the sidebar right the sidebar has to be open yes. for any of this to be going on now what if you yes. what if you uh what if you like declared a custom object 
and then that you wanted to use later because i noticed like say um the add-on menus stay up even though you close the sidebar right the work that you've done uh setting some menus it, in whatever because context that, you're in. You know, yeah, the reason for that is because what you've done there is you've done that server side. You've done that in the UI of the spreadsheet app. Ah, your yeah. sidebar, you've done that. So that's now added, that's now customized the menu of your UI. So it's persistent because it's part of, it's now, it's now part of, um, you know, Google Sheets, if you like, um, having done that. But the stuff on the client side is disposable once you've, Close the sidebar is gone. And, you know, if there is anything that you want to keep, you know, there's various property stores that you can use. Yeah. Yeah, I was hoping to, well, anyway, I don't want to take you off offline. Yeah, I was, I was hoping to replace how I'm using documents, uh, property service by, by having some kind of object that I'm using. But um, I don't know, I'll get around to figuring that out later. Yeah. Uh, it works, it works fine. It works fine, but I'd like to replace it. I, I use the documents uh, uh, property service to keep track of what sheet is open in a, within a certain context of, of my add-on. And I've been doing that so much, you know, now that I know how the pro all the property services work, it'd be nice to use document services for some other things like settings or something like that and then achieve that another way. But the only way I could think of would be to persist a, 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 persist a, a data structure that that uh, that but would, it would need to stay open because the way my my add-on works you know somebody you can start and restart it all you want and you might want to just close it to get it out of your way and keep working and then get back and do something via a menu or something like that well i think i think in a few in an upcoming um uh totally unscripted we do have in fact we were going to do it last month but we never got around to it, how, how to manage settings in in add-ons in terms of not only presenting them and making the, the whole business of setting them up straightforward, but also of saving their current state um, and their amended state and everything like that. So the next time you bring your add-on up, it remembers where it was. So that will be one that we'll probably cover in a future session. Well, I'm conscious that um, uh, for Bruce, it's getting increasingly gloomy. For me, I'm almost is there. It getting, why is it getting gloomy? For, oh, you mean on my thing? It is, isn't it? Put the light on. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering um, what you meant by that. The, uh, <laughs> for Spencer, he's been, for me anyway, blacked out for the whole show. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so I think we might call it a wrap there. And um, thanks, uh, Bruce and uh, Spencer, for their bits and pieces. Thanks, Rudy, as well, for coming along and um, your contributions. We'll be back uh, next month. <laughs> anyway, thanks everyone. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bessel. Thanks, Trudy. Bye.